It's just one name. Dean Baker Orwick. Just one name. But it's one name among over 130 on the Waite High School Memorial for World War II. Orwick was one of the first Toledoans killed in the Second World War. He was killed at Pearl Harbor along with about six other Toledo men. Today, let's learn a little bit more about the events that led to their death and our country's entry into the Second World War. Dean Orwick and six other Toledo men died at Pearl Harbor that day. What we never hear are the stories of the other people who died on December 7th um, in places other than Pearl Harbor. Because the way we're going to think about December 7th, 1941, what Franklin Roosevelt called a day that will live in infamy, we're not thinking of it as Pearl Harbor. We're thinking of it as the Japanese Pacific Offensive. And to understand it, we need to understand a little bit about Japan's situation as it came into the Second World War. So for this, you're going to have to bear with me as I drop back another hundred years in world history. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry, a relative of the Perry after whom Perrysburg is named, um, is leading an expedition of American warships into what was then called Edo Harbor in Japan, today's Tokyo Harbor, and it opens Japan to trade, and opens is a word that covers a lot of sins in this case. After Perry's expedition comes to Japan, there's this period of disruptive change in Japanese society during the time that the United States is fighting the American Civil War. And in 1871, they have what's called the Meiji Restoration. Um, and the restoration is, it's theoretically a restoration of the crown, but in many ways, it's a bunch of very wealthy people trying to move Japan into the 19th century. Um, the modernization that happens is rapid fire. Um, samurai had been enforcers, right? They had been the kind of feudal uh, enforcers for the the lords that, that owned land. Um, and now there's kind of a, a new samurai by the time we get to, to the Meiji Restoration. And um, these are people who are being sent to, to uh, colleges throughout the world to learn science, learn technology. Um, and then the class that they belong to, the samurai class, is abolished and goes away. Um, so what happens is all of these kind of skilled, honorable warrior men have now become scientists and inventors and professors and businessmen. And when they come back, they kind of become the heart of military leadership and industrial leadership in the country. People who are descended of the samurai in many cases are these leaders of these new conglomerates of, of manufacturers. They're leaders and officers within the military. Um, within 20 years, by the time you get to the 1890s, without a doubt, Japan is the most modernized nation in the Pacific Rim. More than Russia, way more than China. Japan has kind of embraced Western technology in a way that neither Russia nor China have. And Japan sees itself as the premier nation on the west end of the Pacific. Now, Japan faces a problem. Um, they've adopted Western technology, iron and steel making, all the things that you make out of iron and steel, the ships, the weapons, everything else. Um, but they don't have any of the natural resources they need. Japan is an amazing country. It's a beautiful country, but it's a country that doesn't really have large deposits of iron ore or coal, the things that you need for steel production. And steel is by far the most important resource when we're talking about this part of history. So Japan leads a series of wars to try, get, try to get access to the resources it needs as part of its economic development. So in 1894-95, um, Japan launches a preemptive strike on China. So they launch a war in China. Um, they're trying to get Korea because the Korean Peninsula had many of the resources that they wanted. The preemptive strike weakened China greatly. Uh, China was not able to mount an effective defense or counteroffensive. The Chinese sign a settlement. The Korean Peninsula is given away. Certain concessions are given away in other parts of mainland China. And they get their coal that they wanted. Um, Ten years after that, 
they launch a war very similar to the Sino-Japanese War against Russia. It involves a preemptive strike. They believed that resources in this area called Manchuria, uh, which is on the border between China and Russia, um, would be the final frontier, and it would be room for the Japanese population to grow. It would be more resources. Manchuria is a resource-rich area of Asia. Um, and the Japanese military in these early years has set themselves a pattern, right? We launch a preemptive strike without warning, a sneak attack, if you will, in Western kind of uh, lore and legend. Um, we launch this preemptive attack without notice, with surprise. We beat an enemy much larger than us quickly, and we force them to negotiate to get the things that we want. If you know anything about Pearl Harbor, this blueprint should sound really familiar to you. What they do in 94 against China, what they do in 04 against Russia, is exactly what they're going to try to do in 41 against the United States. Um, I shouldn't say exactly, but it's, it's very similar to what they're trying to do. Um, the new samurai class, these businessmen who are running large conglomerate companies called Saibatsu, um, they promote loyalty to the emperor as what makes Japan great. And the figure of the emperor provides a rallying point for people during this time of upheaval. Restoring the empire, restoring the emperor, the emperor is the one thing everybody has in common, no matter what their station is in life. If they're a fisherman, if they're a farmer, if they're a factory worker, if they're a soldier or sailor, we can all focus on the emperor as the thing that makes us all inherently Japanese. Um, Japan ends up, uh, less than 10 years after the Russo-Japanese War, um, Japan ends up joining World War I as an allied nation. And they do a great service to the Allies, especially the British and the French, by securing British islands that existed in the Pacific and making sure the British and the French uh, still could access materials and territories that they possessed in the Pacific. So Japan really did a solid uh, for the Allies. The problem is, as we've already talked about in this class, in the treaties after World War I, including the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies do not treat their friends well, much less their enemies. And you guys, at this point in your education, you famously know from your World Studies class how bad the Versailles Treaty was and how it punished Germany and that helped create Hitler. What you don't know as much, probably, is how the treaties, like Versailles, also punished the people who were on Britain and France's side. Japan gets almost nothing from Versailles. They get possession of a few islands, but the thing they really wanted was to be taken seriously. We want to be an equal partner. We believe our nation is just as great as Britain, just as great as France. We want to be treated equally. And instead, they're treated as some kind of lesser power, a second-rate power. So when there's these naval limitation treaties that come about in the 1920s, the Japanese, the British, and the Americans are allowed to keep five capital ships, and the Japanese are told, oh, you, you fellas, you can only have this many because you're just a little country and you don't need it, and they're mad. They've been deeply, gravely insulted, especially since they were loyal allies in the First World War. Um, this is going to change minds in the Japanese military and make them believe these Western nations that we were friends with, they cannot be trusted. So... What do they do? They start looking for other places. What else do we need to do to secure our own future? Um, in 1931, they lead a full invasion of Manchuria. There had been Japanese businesses in Manchuria. There had been limited Japanese military uh, presence there, but they don't fully invade the place and take it over until 31. Over the next five or six years, the Japanese military starts consolidating power at home. So the, the army is starting to get members of the army elected to the parliament, elected to this, appointed as prime minister, and so on and so forth. Um, this cannot happen in a country like the United States, right? If you're going to hold an important job in the United States government, uh, you have to resign your commission if you're active duty. It's different for reserves, it's different for guard. So we do have people who are reservists and national guardsmen who are in our, our, our government today, um, but you can't be an active duty soldier and be a, uh, a congressperson at the same time. Um, Japanese military has taken out a lot of civilian leadership. 
And then there's a bunch of crises in Japan that end up leading to the Japanese military controlling most of the power and then controlling most of what's happening in China. Um, the China incident happens in the fall of 37, near the end of Lou Diamond's time in China as one of the China Marines, um, because there had been a Marine detachment left in China uh, since the very early 1900s in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, in the fall of 37, Japanese troops uh, decide they need to start invading other parts of China, and they take almost every one of the major coastal cities. And uh, you read about this with uh, Florence Lang and her, her husband getting killed uh, in Shanghai and um, all of these other major port cities in, in uh, China are going to get taken. Now, here's the problem, and this is the trouble with war. As we talked about with Santa von Clausewitz many weeks ago, war is about having a goal. What is your goal? What are you really trying to do here? The Japanese goal is to control China and make them stop fighting or something, okay? The problem is the Japanese army is focused on every battle. Will we win this battle? And the fact is the Japanese do win every battle. They win them decisively. The Chinese fight. They fight really hard. The Japanese take a lot of casualties, and then the Chinese disappear. And the Japanese go, hey, we won. Look at us. Pat it on the back. We did a great job. We captured Shanghai, but they didn't really kill very many Chinese soldiers and they really didn't destroy their ability to fight. The Chinese have melted back into the wilderness. And when the Japanese decide they're going to invade the next place, the Chinese are going to fight them really hard and disappear again. Um, this is classic guerrilla warfare. This is classic strategy. When you're the outmatched force, it is exactly what American armies did during the American Revolution, especially in the South in places like Carolinas and Georgia. Fight the British, draw them further into the countryside, disappear. Fight them again, disappear. And the Japanese are starting to get mad because they've been fighting really hard in Japan. They've been taking grievous casualties. I'm sorry, they've been, they've been fighting really hard in China. They've been taking grievous casualties in China and they're still not winning. They still don't have any control over China. They control certain parts of certain cities and that's it. It gets really frustrating because in 39 and 40, they're going to see Hitler and Mussolini roll through this African country, roll through Greece, roll through Albania, roll through Poland and Czechoslovakia and the low countries in France. And the Japanese start to think, well, this isn't fair. Why, why is this working so well for them? And they start to turn their attention elsewhere and they decide maybe we can't get what we need in China. Maybe we need to look at Southeast Asia. And these are places like today's Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, and moving down kind of towards Australia. Um, think for just a minute strategically about what the Japanese are producing uh, as, a, as a plan here, because it's kind of crazy. We can't win the war we're in. And we're not going to stop fighting it, so let's just pick another war. Think about the thought processes that take you to that place for just a minute. So Japan doubles down on their agreements with the Axis, with Germany and, and Italy. And they say, yes, we are absolutely part of this well-thought-out plan. Um, and their, their idea is when the French and British fall, we'll get to take their colonies and administer places like Hong Kong and Indochina and stuff as part of the Axis agreements. The only threat to what they're trying to do is the United States, because the United States has a big pre uh, presence in the Pacific. They have the Philippines, they have a bunch of islands in the middle of the Pacific, and the United States has a large Pacific fleet. We have a lot of ships in the Pacific. So the only people who are really a threat to anything the Japanese want to do are the American naval fleets, which are based at, you guessed it, Pearl Harbor. Now, the resources that are around there, what you're looking at here, this is today's Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand. There's tin and aluminum down there, which if you're going to fight a war, you're going to need those. There's oil in Indonesia, which was uh, then the, the Dutch East Indies. There's American warships at the Philippines, which pose a threat to you. And there's U.S. warships at Guam that pose a threat to you. 
and there are U.S. warships at Hawaii. So, planning the offensive. The Japanese generals plan out this massive offensive that they're going to launch to try and take out all of the threats at once. Um, first of all, the Japanese have no reason to believe the Americans will fight back at all. Um, because of Congress tying President Roosevelt's hands and Congress again and again and again saying we're not going to get into a war and the American people saying again and again and again, America first, we have no interest in being part of a war. The United States did nothing the entire time that the Japanese are rolling over all these other countries in Asia. And in fact, during Japan's war in China, the Japanese specifically targeted a United States naval vessel, USS Panay, bombed it, sank it, killed dozens of Americans, and the response of your United States government was, this is terrible, this is awful, Japan, we are gonna, we're gonna write a really nasty letter to you. And you're not gonna like it, because it's gonna be a mean letter. We write these things called strongly worded opinions, okay? over the course of four years. Every time the Japanese do something, and Americans are gonna die in a lot of these things. And we're like, listen, man, you do that one more time, and we are gonna, we are gonna send you another letter, okay? The Japanese are looking at the United States as a joke, okay? Um, so in July of 41, Isoroku Yamamoto, probably the greatest of the Japanese flag officers, the smartest, the one who kind of understood the big picture better than any of the rest, um, Yamamoto and staff start mapping out a six-month strategic plan from the summer of 41 to the winter of 42. Um, and the, the idea that they come up with is this. In the fall, they're going to send lots of ground forces down into today's Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, down into the Dutch East Indies, uh, uh, today's Indonesia. Um, when the United States does nothing about this, which he called exactly, um, then we're going to take out the U.S. fleet at the Philippines. We're going to take out the U.S. ships and planes at Guam. We're going to sink the entire Pacific fleet at Hawaii. And then we're going to establish a perimeter in the middle of the Pacific. A perimeter being like the outer boundary of the stuff that you control. And when we do that, we hope for the best. Because just like 1894 against China... Just like 1904 against Russia, are we the strongest guy? Can we fight forever? No. But if we can deal one crippling blow, we have a chance of getting that bigger adversary to agree to what we want. And frankly, worked with China, worked with Russia, and there was no reason to believe it wasn't going to work with the United States as well. Now, most of the Japanese high command thinks this is a fabulous idea and it can't miss. Yamamoto says... I guarantee you six months of victory. I'll give you six months of victory. We can keep this thing going until the spring and summer of 42. But if the Americans decide they're going to keep fighting after that, we're toast. And Yamamoto, as usual, was absolutely right. He gave them six months of victory, and they couldn't keep it going because America did not quit. Um, Yamamoto also understands that you're fighting a new kind of war. Many people in Japan wanted to keep investing in battleships. You guys know battleships, right? Big long ship. It's got the big turrets with like three guns. Donk, 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 right? Um, other guns all over the thing. People really believed it was the age of the battleship. Yamamoto said, uh uh, it's the age of the aircraft carrier. Air and sea need to work hand in glove. So every one of Yamamoto's operations is going to begin with carrier-based aircraft making the first strike. The opposing force, the United States in most of these cases, the first thing you're going to do is attack their airfields and destroy their airplanes before they can get off the ground. Then you make a second pass at their shipping. So this is what the Japanese are going to do to the Americans at Pearl Harbor. It's what they're going to uh, do very successfully in the Philippines against American forces. It's what they're going to do in Guam against American forces. It's what they're going to do in Hong Kong and um, Singapore against British forces. Um, and it's going to work really well. It is probably the biggest novelty in the early stages of the Second World War. Almost everything else in war was basically an improved version of something that had happened already. 
So World War II is going to have tanks that are faster and better armored with bigger guns. But there were tanks in the First World War. World War II is going to have machine guns that fire faster, but there were machine guns in the First World War. World War II is going to have quick mobile forces that break through and the infantry exploits the gap, but you had already had that in the First World War. The big novelty in this war, the thing that didn't exist before, is this idea of the aircraft carrier as the center of your fleet. It has been the center of everything the United States has done since. We structure everything around our carrier forces to this day. And many people believe, people who are smarter than me, I believe it too because smarter people than me say it, um, the era of the carrier is probably over right now. We just don't know it because we haven't been in that kind of war yet. Because now we live in a war where a nation with a $100,000 drone properly equipped can probably take out a $1.2 billion carrier in a matter of minutes. And you have to wonder, is the carrier still the most useful thing in the world? Or is the carrier the world's biggest floating target? Um, the tactical plan. So Yamamoto has his big strategic plan. His tactical plan is different. Um, he understood how important the carriers were, even if not everybody in America did. So his first tactical assumption is America's three major carriers, the Pacific Fleet, will be at Pearl Harbor and we will sink them. But he gets unlucky for maybe the only time in this operation. And none of the American carriers were at Pearl Harbor. They were all at sea by the time the Japanese fleet left their ports in Japan in November, heading for this December rendezvous to attack all these different American targets. They maintained radio silence the whole way. I can't tell you guys how difficult this is to not have any radio transmissions going on uh, back and forth between all these different strike groups going all over the Pacific Ocean, all of you trying to launch your attacks within a few hours of each other two weeks from now. Um, the major targets, Pearl Harbor, Guam, the Philippines, and Wake, for the major United States targets, and then Malaya, Thailand, uh, Shanghai, and uh, later the island of Midway um, around the Pacific. They massed their fleets off the coasts, off the coast far enough where they couldn't be seen, and launched these coordinated attacks within hours of each other. There was no time for one target to, to warn another. The only exception to that we will talk about in the Philippines, where the Philippines did have time and it was blown. And you'll hear that in the America's First Steps lecture. The attack on Pearl Harbor. The attack came in from in front of the sun, uh, which makes it difficult to spot. If there's a big, bright, shiny ball in the sky and the airplanes are coming from the direction of the big, shiny ball in the sky, it's hard to see it coming. Follow-up waves, um, and, and that first wave, of course, came in to destroy all the aircraft on the ground. Follow-up waves are going to mop up Battleship Row and take out all the ships there. So the red represents the Japanese planes. East is this way, so the sun's coming up over here, and you see that the planes, the Japanese planes, approached from the north and then made these passes on the American airfields, and they're coming out of the, basically coming out of the east at Pearl Harbor. This is the scene down at Pearl Harbor. This is a photograph taken from a Japanese gun, gun sight camera. Um, this is Fort Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor. And you see all the boats right next to each other. Look at that. The battleships are even tied off to each other. How convenient is that if you're trying to bomb things? Uh, we did half the job for them. And you can see the plumes coming up from the first bombs being dropped on uh, American ships by the Japanese uh, naval air forces. Nine battleships, three cruisers, three destroyers, three auxiliary ships are hit that first day. Only three of those ships were complete losses. You've probably heard of the USS Arizona, and there were, in fact, a couple of Toledoans aboard the Arizona. Um, but it's one of very few ships that were completely toast that day. Other ships were hit, but they're in a harbor, and the water isn't that deep. So even though they sank, they didn't sink 100 feet below the surface. They landed on the surface, and part of the ship was still above the surface. So over the course of the next few months, the United States Navy pumped out those ships, repaired those ships, and got them back in action. Um, the attack happened on a Sunday morning. They didn't kill that many people like they would have if they had hit 
on a Monday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or a Tuesday at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, on a Sunday morning, most sailors were not on the ships. They were on shore leave, and it minimized the casualties. And then most importantly, none of the three fleet carriers were there. If any of the carriers had been there, we would have been in deep, deep doo-doo. Um, but they weren't. And that basically sums up the story of the Japanese Pacific Offensive of 1941. Uh, in our next lecture, we're going to talk about America's first moves after that, um, many of which are going to be centered in the Philippines, uh, which is going to be an abject disaster. Thanks for sticking with me, guys. And as always, even with all of this, you're doing great.